Hey, welcome back. In this video, we're looking at the bird's eye view of a car that is for now traveling in a straight path. It's just going, let's say, in this direction. Uh, let's say it has a velocity of 90 kilometers per hour. And it's a constant velocity, so its acceleration is zero. And let's just specify a mass for the car because we're going to come back to this later. Let's say it's 1200 kilograms. Um, when you start seeing masses identified in problems, we're really getting into the realm of kinetics, which all revolves around this formula, F equals MA. Um, but in this case, if we have acceleration equals zero, then um, the, that's telling us that the net force acting on the car is zero. And if you remember back to way back to statics, when you talk about static equilibrium, as long as the system is not accelerating, then it's in static equilibrium. So it can have a velocity that's not zero, but as long as acceleration is zero, then it's just chilling. And this car is not, or this mass, you know, this car, or whatever, is not accelerating in any particular direction. It's just going to continue going along its path at the constant velocity. But if we introduced a non-zero force to this system, um, let's say for now that that force was in line with the direction of travel like that, then we would just have a non-zero acceleration in that direction and it would still remain uh, a linear motion problem. But if we identified a force that was, say, always normal to the direction of travel, so if we just bring this back a little bit to the center of mass and then point it out, let's say, to the left, and if this net force is always going to the left, then we're going to have some acceleration that's in that direction. And as long as this acceleration is always normal to the, the velocity or the path being traveled, then we're going to result in angular motion. Uh, basically, this vehicle will start curving off to the left, there's a certain force or a certain acceleration that will lock it into a circular path. And when that happens, that's when it becomes into the realm of circular motion. So you can imagine we have this car traveling on a circular track, which tells us that the path that it's moving in is circular. So this is a circular motion problem. We would refer to this acceleration that's going off to the left as the normal acceleration, or also uh, some people would like to call it the centripetal acceleration. And then we would specify that the acceleration that's currently zero up here, uh, we would give it a subscript T for the tangential acceleration. And basically we break down this problem into the tangential components, which are going tangent to the path traveled and the normal components. So V is often referred to, you don't usually put the subscript T, but we can if we want, um, but the tangential velocity, tangential acceleration, and then we have the normal acceleration, or also called the centripetal acceleration, which is caused by the normal force in this case, which is a non-zero force. And ultimately, in this type of problem, would be provided by the friction between the car tires and the pavement. But often in circular motion problems, you're not usually asked to talk too much about the nature of the force, um, more just asked to calculate the, the inward acceleration or calculate the, the magnitude of the force itself. So anyways, um, let's go ahead and solve uh, some things about this problem. If we know we have a tangential velocity of, uh, of 90 kilometers per hour and a radius of 100 meters of a circular path, um, we, can, we can calculate the normal acceleration and also the force that causes it with these really simple formulas. They're just for the normal or centripetal acceleration. It's just the tangential velocity squared over the radius. And for the force that causes that, um, the normal force, well, it's just equal to mass times acceleration, right? F equals ma, but we're using the normal acceleration here. Again, this is also sometimes referred to as the centripetal force. But we've just identified that the normal acceleration is v squared over r, so we can write this as equal to m times v squared over r. And also, if you remember, in our expression that relates tangential velocity and angular velocity, we have v is equal to r omega. So if we just plug that in for v squared here, we just get um, m times r squared omega squared all over r. So this r cancels out with one of those, and we're just left with this other expression, m r omega squared. So sometimes you'll see the normal or centripetal force given with this expression here, fn is equal to mv squared over r, or other times you'll see it here, fn is equal to mr omega squared. So I'm gonna go through and solve both ways for this, uh, but we're gonna figure out what that normal force is in this setup and also what the normal acceleration is. Um, so first let's convert 90 kilometers per hour into meters per second. So we have uh, for v, 
is 90 kilometers per hour. Uh, we need to change the units here, so let's get rid of the kilometers. We have one kilometer for 1,000 meters, and then one hour is 60 minutes, and then one minute is 60 seconds. So that is all those units are going to cancel out. We have kilometers canceling with kilometers, hours canceling with hours, and minutes canceling with minutes, and that just leaves us with units of meters per second. And 90 times 1,000 divided by 60 divided by 60 gives us 25 meters per second, which was our tangential velocity v. Let's also use our expression that relates tangential velocity to angular velocity because we will need that uh, in this section over here. So v equals r omega. So let's we'll just rearrange this for omega. So we have omega is equal to v over r, which is going to be 25 meters per second over 100 meters, which is just going to give us 0 0.25 radians per second for omega. Let's write that really clearly. Omega is 0 0.25 radians per second. So let's calculate the tr centripetal or normal acceleration first. So a n equals a c is equal to v squared over r. So we just have 25 meters per second all squared over 100 meters. And that is going to reduce down to 6.25 meters per second squared. That is equal to the normal acceleration. So that's often what you're asked to solve for. And there you go, right there. And to solve for the normal force, which is the force that results in this acceleration, we can solve both ways. So let's start out with Fn. It's also referred to the centripetal force. Let's use the first method that I circled in green above, which is mv squared over r. So we have 1,200 kilograms for the mass times v squared, which is 25 meters per second, all squared, over 100 meters. This works out to be 7,500 kilogram meter per second squared. Which hopefully you recognize that unit that's uh, that is newtons so 7500 newtons and often we will uh, reduce this to um, or change that units to uh, kilonewtons so 7.5 kilonewtons and just to make one last check here let's see if we can solve this and get the same value for fn is equal to f centripetal using the other method which is mr omega squared if we just fill in our values here, we have 1,200 kilograms times the radius, 100 meters, times omega squared. Omega was 0 0.25 radians per second. We're going to square all that. And when you punch that into your calculator, again, it spits out 7,500, and the units work out to kilogram meters per second squared, which is, again, exactly the same thing. Fn is equal to 7.5 kilonewtons. So we can just throw a box around one of those, or both, I guess. They're exactly the same thing. Uh, but there you go. That is kind of how to work through these types of problems, where often the goal is you're given information just like this problem, and you're asked to solve for the normal acceleration and the normal force that's causing that acceleration. So I hope that helps. And uh, again, just talking about that inclusion of mass here, that's going to take us right into kinetics, which is the topic of the next couple videos. So good luck, and I'll see you guys there.